All right. Hello, guys, and welcome back to the Channel 42. Welcome, guys and gals and all. How are you doing, gentlemen? Tor, how are you doing? Oh, I'm so good, so good. Excellent. Troy? Fantastic. Looking forward to the end of the week and uh, what's coming up for next week. What's next week? Oh, it's uh, Cisco Live. It uh, well, certainly so is. Starting off the, the round of, uh, of uh, vendor conferences, or at least uh, what I see is the 2021 season of vendor conferences. So it'd uh, be interesting to see what they present. Do you guys miss the meeting up with real people and socializing and so on and so forth? Troy? Absolutely, I do. I think that's a big part of the value uh, from a lot of these conferences. Uh, a, a good portion of tech content, uh, they record it or they share it offline, so you can always watch that later. But it's those um, kind of in between those hallway conversations or the evening conversations that you have, um, where you can just bring up topics and share experiences, uh, bond yeah. with other people. Uh, that's a big part of the, the, the value that I, I see conferences bring and the big part that I think is missing. Awesome. So what about you? Uh, same uh, feeling. Uh, I, I really love to, to go to the uh, conference physically be present there uh, and and there's something special by sitting in a room with uh, hundreds of people and listening into a, a specific topic uh, and from for my part it's easier to focus um, if I'm if I'm going to to look at the videos uh, after the the conference or after next week I I will soon see a squirrel in the garden yeah. Um, and be sidetracked. Uh, yeah. It's so easy, but uh, but a given time that it it's what we can get. But I would really love to see the the in person conferences coming again. So I agree with you both hundred percent. I I I miss the communication with colleagues and things. I have a question for you. Then do you think we'll see in live conferences this year? Talk. Um, I don't think this year. I actually think that uh, the world, we all will kind of wait it out and see if uh, it stabilizes, uh, will be getting better. Um, and I, I do actually expect that we'll see less in-person conferences because we have seen that the virtual conferences, the virtual meetings, actually can work it's not a perfect solution but it can work troy what do you think i think that there's um a couple of vendors that have uh cities lined up for what it sounds like will be in-person uh, conferences this year whether or not they go ahead uh, that's a different uh, thing but it sounds like they're planning for live live conferences starting at june september i've seen some yeah. uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens there i think we'll continue with the hybrid model uh, a lot of people can't make it for various reasons, so they'll have um, uh, virtual access for them to, to join, um, just give them more flexibility, bring in uh, larger audiences. Um, but, but I think there will be a desire to move back to, to live in-person uh, conferences, and they, they do bring a lot of value. It's, the question is, how, how soon do we get there? And that's, I think, still unknown at this point. So I know that um, I've already booked up for DEF CON and Black Hat in summer. Um, I'm hoping that's going to go ahead. And what I'm hearing from contact is they're pushing it to try and make it live. But we'll see. Um, and then, of course, there are other things in the fall as well I'm hoping to attend. Uh, I just really hope we can start going back this year. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, other news then, gentlemen. Uh, how are things going with everything else? Uh, has anybody actually got any AX stuff, Wi-Fi 6? Any Wi-Fi 6E? Yeah. Wi-Fi 6, yes, not E. Um, okay. had, haven't really started in Europe. Uh, so we kind of have to wait it out uh, until you in the North American region get it tested out. Yeah. So, yeah. I, 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 somebody in the family needed a, a new phone, so I immediately offered them my phone then I have to buy a new phone. Oh. So I've got a Samsung S21. I've got no access point to connect it to, of course. I bought another PCI platform that I can plug in my desktop computer that's 6E. And I've ordered the Asus 
AXE 11,000, which mm-hmm. was promised to be shipped on the 23rd of March. Then I got an email saying, sorry, got to wait till the 16th of April. Now, I believe that that is actually shipped because different people in the Twitter sphere are blogging about they doing things in six gigahertz, but it doesn't seem to be shipped on mass yet. Uh, Amazon said I could buy one for like $900 if I really wanted one. And I'm like, no, thank you very much. So I relied on my friend Newegg, which is just normal pricing, but it was delayed. So uh, maybe we can talk about that sometime in the future. Um, of course, Wi-Fi 6 is the Wi-Fi Alliance certification. I do not believe that AX has been finalized yet. It's still dragging, I think, isn't it? I, I'm not, not sure if it's actually been, it's been fully baked yet, or if it has, it's been, it's been in the last week or two. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, is what we keep on being told. Mm. So I can do a quick check on that very quickly. It was board approved uh, February 9th. Yeah. Let me just use the, mag- the magic power of Google. So it is there, but it, it came in too late to be included as part of the uh, the 2020 uh, standard. So the is- 802.11.2020 release. So we've always been talking about the 2016 standard, of course, as you mentioned, Troy, now we have the 2020 standard, right? Which is pretty impressive. So according to the 802.11 Timelines website, 802.11 AX is still in process. So the only published standard they have at the moment is of course the 802.11 2020. And as you said, um, I don't think we expected AX to make it. We kind of hoped it would, but it but there's like a, a maintenance group that has to work on this for a while beforehand. So a lot of people expected that AX would stay outside of 2020 and will probably be the first amendment. Unless of course AY gets in there, which it it just may do. Now that will be interesting. A new release of 60 gigahertz, a new life in the 60 gigahertz. You guys played the 60 gigahertz at all? A little bit. I think it has very uh, niche uh, applicability. Very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So 802.11 2020 is out. That's now going to be the the standard because we all whenever we argue about something or or hotly discuss, that will be the thing we refer back to. I did see some notes on Twitter that people were saying that you can buy the standard from the IEEE, and it's it's not cheap. So it's 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 a couple of several hundred, like five hundred or something so dollars to buy the standard. If you remember, uh, if you're not a member, it's even more. So um, interesting, right? Interesting. We'll, yeah. we'll see. So, so this is nothing new. Uh, the IEEE has had this policy for the 8211 standards uh, for, for several, several years now. And I remember um, it was a while ago, I got into a debate with uh, some security people on Twitter um, who were saying that the, the reason that we had a lot of vulnerabilities with WPA2 was that the IEEE standard was closed off from security researchers. And so I was pointing out that the, the 11i standard at, at that point was, was over 10 years old. Right, and so it's uh, it's been available, widely available to the public. Um, after six months of the standard being released, or the 811 uh, family of, of standards being released, the IEEE released that standard for free at no cost. So, like you said, at, at the moment, because it was just released, uh, you have to pay the five or six hundred dollars to access it. Um, if you're part of a, an educational institution, you you get uh, access to it at no charge, is my understanding. But after six months, uh, they release it to the public for free. And so after we went back and forth with uh, some of the security people on, on this uh, topic, uh, eventually they conceded that it was free, it was accessible, uh, but then the problem was that it was um, too hard to understand, right? That they essentially <laughs> they need to, to simplify the standard so that it was more understandable um, by security researchers so that they could do uh, their work. So it's, it's just a, it, it, it is kind of, um, uh, you know, a- engineering speak. So I, I think they could make it a little easier to understand, but uh, the argument kept changing once they realized that it was accessible for over a decade. The reason that there's flaws in it is because it was simplified, right? That's the point. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome. But that, of course, 
does have some merit in for WPA3. The, mm -hmm. the Wi-Fi Alliance developed WPA3 in closed doors. And uh, when it came out, a lot of people were somewhat negative towards it. But what I was reading is this was a lot of excitable negativity for no genuine reason. Um, a lot of the vendors were like, yeah, we fixed those vulnerabilities months ago. And if you if you run the latest version of code, those vulnerabilities aren't even real anymore. Uh, so a lot of the hoo-ha about WPA3 is broken is WPA3 had some vulnerabilities, but the vendors have already fixed them was what I heard. And so that really was a non-event. And you know, you've know, you got to give credit to the people who do the IEEE and, and the Wi-Fi Alliance. They work incredibly hard. So I think we need to be a little bit more positive because it's not the IEEE's fault or the Wi-Fi Alliance's fault that you know WEP was broken nearly 20 years ago, right? It, a lot of people will say, oh, not I, I know people who still run WEP. And you're like, what are you doing? It's easy to break. As a grocery store, I know the guy's like, look, if they want to come in and count how many oranges I have, they're more than welcome to come in and count. If they hack into yeah, Wi-Fi and they hear the barcode scanner saying how many oranges we got, I don't care, right? The, the, general mis the general misunderstanding with web was that it was meant to be security. Right. Uh, it's more like, uh, as the naming is, uh, it's, it's what equivalent privacy. Yes. So it's more yeah. to make it more private, not secure. And yeah. it's never been secure. So, yeah. yeah. But that's, oh. that's the, the general misunderstanding. And that's why it's getting hit uh, or got hit a lot. I, I do a lot of Wi-Fi pen testing, hacking and experimentation and things. And, you know, I, I tell people, look, who uses pre-shared keys? And they put their hands up and I'm like, okay, if someone asks you, do you use pre-shared key? Never put your hand up. Don't admit to it. But it's okay because, you know, you all have like 13 to 15 character, multi-mixed keyboard characters, numeric, alphanumeric, special characters. And you all change your pre-shared key every 30 days. And when someone leaves the company, you change the pre-shared key, right? And they all look at you, you know, like deer in headlights. No, they don't. And then I show oh. them, I show them my little uh, mining demonstration where I, I take my my old miner. It's a little old now. It, it's it's not that lucrative anymore. And I convert it into a hashcat password cracker. And it, I do a dictionary attack on nine million words on my laptop in a VM, and it takes six hours to do a dictionary attack. And on my little Hashcat machine, it takes 0.27 seconds to break a WPA2, WPA pre-shared key. That's eight characters long. If you make it nine characters long, well, actually it's irrelevant because it's doing a dictionary attack. If you do a brute force attack, it can take several days. But when you say it can take several days, that's the point, right? Several days. Yeah. So don't use pre-shared key or yeah. use 15 character pre-shared key. Go ahead, Tom. No, no, I agree with you. It's it's still weak. Uh, several days is nothing. Um, month, year, um, I don't care. You should actually have a more secure system. So 15 characters, as you said, or well, better. Two, yes, or better. The, the tool I have, it's just graphics cards. And you run this utility on it and it disperses the... Um, the field space to each of the graphics cards. So each of them starts off in a different portion of the search space. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the beauty is, is that if you were to go out and buy a, an NVIDIA 3080 graphics card today, that one graphics card will have the same hash power as my eight graphics cards. So if you put eight, eight 3080s in my machine, it's literally 10 times the functionality, right? And then also, you can also uh, build them together in a kind of mesh construct where a top level system can share the search space between low level systems in a hierarchical system. So you can connect maybe 10 of them together and it'll give out the search space to each of the subordinate systems, which in turn will give out the search space to each of the graphics cards on that system. And my one runs in Windows because it was convenient. If you use a Linux variant, it's it's even faster. So if you've got 10 of them, then that's 10 times. So now, because you've gone up to the 3080 graphics cards, that's 10 times. So now my week can be done in like 0.7 of a week or, or one seventh of a week. 
now that you've put them in a hierarchical system, you can do it in 0.70 of a week, which is just simply minutes. Okay, why do you stop that? Well, you go to a longer password. A nine-character password takes a month. A 10-character password, I'm making up numbers, that takes six months. A 15-character password is like you know a million years or something, right? And so that's where the length of the string becomes important in a brute force attack because you've got to go through every single possibility. And there are still people that have like an eight-character pre-shared key, which is I try and encourage them not to do that. So both the IEEE and the Wi-Fi Alliance recommend a minimum 20 uh, character length passwords. Yeah. So they have that recommendation, but it's, it's also interesting to note that uh, you have the challenge of usability versus you know making more complex and uh, passwords resilient to brute force packing or cracking. So the when the IEEE was originally developing the 11i standard for so for, for the kind of roughly equivalent to WPA2, uh, a lot of vendors were pushing back and they, they thought eight characters was too much that it'd be a burden on the users. And they were trying to settle as a four character uh, as the minimum for the password length, right? And so they, they, minutes. Well, by today's standards, yeah. but yeah. you go back uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was a little longer, but uh, the, user, the usability of four characters, even eight characters, the reason you have a lot of these small characters is if I have a, a password, you know, that's 20 or 50 characters of uh, special characters, uppercase, lowercase, uh, you know, if you configure that at your house and your buddy comes over and wants to, to share the, the Wi-Fi network or you know, kids come over for a sleepover uh, so that they can get a hold of their parents in case something comes up and they ask for the Wi-Fi password, imagine giving them 50 characters of a long car, uh, complex string. Like that's, um, it, I, I don't think it's very usable, right? So unless you have some sort of uh, mechanism in place to easily share uh, the, the, the password, I think it's um, the usability, it becomes a challenge. So it's a nice story saying, hey, have a long, complex password, um, but you contrast that with usability, and it, I think it quickly falls flat. So the, 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 problem, the problem with that is when you extend the length of the password, it becomes more secure. And if you imagine, if you imagine a, hill, a hill going up on the security, there comes like a drop-off cliff point where when you extend the password longer than a certain number, what people do is they write down the password. And so all the gain you've got on the hill of increased security is wiped out because once the password is written down somewhere, do you throw away that text into the garbage? Do you, do you throw away, yeah. do you leave it on a yellow sticky underneath the keyboard? So the problem becomes usability is the key point there, Troy. People start counter operating against your security by taking shortcuts. Um, I changed the password routinely the other day on the home network, and my kids were like, what's the password? And I told them, because I, I, I try and use it like some kind of mnemonic, something that means something to me. And I told them what it was, and they immediately wrote it down. I'm like, yeah, please don't do that. Or write it down. Once you've typed it in, bring me back the piece of paper so we can shred it. Because I shred all yellow stickies I have in my house. All my yellow stickies, I'm paranoid, right? Um, I shred all documentation, bills and everything. I don't throw them in the garbage. Because uh, there are dumpster divers that will go looking for information. And if you've got your password or your passphrase written down on a yellow sticky in the garbage, now they can come into your property and use your free Wi-Fi. Okay? How many devices have you got on Wi-Fi? I, I remember this happened to me a while back where I was using a, I had a Cisco ASA firewall that allowed for up to 10, 10 nodes and I couldn't connect to it. And I'm like, why can't I connect to it? I, I don't have 10 devices. So I looked, at, I looked at the Cisco ASA and I had 23 devices because I'd forgotten about, uh, you know, everybody's got a, a phone and an old phone and a tablet and a laptop and the Apple TV. And then my Netgear switch had an IP address. And I'm like, why has my Netgear switch got an IP address? It's an unmanaged switch. So I had about two or three Netgear switches. They'd all got IP addresses. Apparently, this particular model of Netgear switches auto-update uh, auto update when a new version of software comes out. So the unmanaged switch that shouldn't get an IP address because you can't connect to it was requesting an IP address on my network. So now, I was like, oh, now, this is scary when we... 
when we're talking security, a device that on itself decides to go to the internet wouldn't happen own. in my in my network. Uh, but I'm I might be even more paranoid. Um, the, the scenario we are talking about, the pre-check key, as you say, Troy, is, is usually uh, in our small small office uh, and home environment. Um, and I agree that it, we need to have, make it usable because, as you also say, Phil, if if it's not is if it's not usable, it's not accepted by our users, then they'll go ahead and do shortcuts. My recommendation is use a set sentence for crying out loud. Pass phrases instead of these complex passwords. Uh, mnemonic is good idea, uh, but a, a simple sentence uh, with spaces in it uh, is actually really helpful. Um, and uh, the, the Wi-Fi gear we get today would allow spaces in the pre-share key. And as you said, Troy, it's, it's, it, if you have four characters, you can, you, can, you can share that easily. And some people can remember that. I actually have some pin uh, codes on my, my credit cards. That's four letters. And I tend to forget that. Whereas I, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, happy of using passphrases because I can create a passphrase with 32 characters or, yeah. And, and I, I can remember it easily because it's, it's something, and, and now I'm saying something that's in security world is, is a kind of a not recommended because I can relate to what's in the password, but it's something that I can relate to and not that many other. So for a pre-share key, I would say that would be a really good idea. Enterprise, no way, don't use it. Um, that will be dot one X. WPA2, free enterprise. To your point, to your point Tor, like if you're a Star Wars fan, may the force oh. be with you is, is a stupid passphrase. Well, it's like, well, is it? Just just talk like Yoda, right? Force be with you, me. It's exactly. To brute you can do that. that. Yeah. And people are like, yeah, but you know, they're words. Okay. So instead of using spaces, put your favorite number in. So what's your favorite number? Three. So type in May three, the four, force, or own, as long as you have an algorithm. Yes, whatever. Exactly, yeah. And, and that's the yeah. key point, right? Yeah. Now, if you if you can say, you know, all the even ones, we hold shift. So we press shift two, shift four, and we get at and dollar instead. As long as you have a simple algorithm that is repeatable, but then, of course, the simple algorithm must never be written down or given out. No, and then we're back to Troy's point. It has to be something you can communicate yes, to easily. the friend that's visiting you. So, and I agree with you, Troy. If, if it's not easy, we will get it. We get, we'll get breaches uh, mm -hmm. for sure. So I disagree with both of you now. I don't give out my Wi-Fi password to friends. No, I, I don't them, either. I let them connect to my guest network at home. Yes, I have a guest network at home. <laughs> but but, right, but we're, how do they, we're not. Sorry, Troy. What is it? How do what, how do you secure your guest network? It's um, WPA three, of course. Now I'm being facetious, right? Because if they am if they am with the client, then it won't work. So yeah. so that's the point, right? I I would use the guest network uh, has a pre shared key that's much simpler. So right, but that, that's my point now, to, because you need to share a key, right? Yeah. So whether it's your home network or guest network, you still have a, a key sharing problem, yeah. right? And so to make yeah. that key easier to share, you just said that you made it simpler. Yeah, which, which is the problem. So, so people mm -hmm. can get on my guest network. Now, should I limit that? I don't at home, of course. Uh, if when, when, when long-term friends, you know, when friends come to visit for a family from England, come over for a longer term, then... What we do is, of course, we share we share the real key. So there comes a point then when you have to decide, well, do you not share the key? Do, do I get access to their device and do I type in the key on their device? And, and what this all comes down to, guys, is something that I talk about in every security class is convenience. Inconvenience is a hacker's best friend. The more convenient something is, the easier it is to find ways around it.
and hack into it. The reason we don't use 25 character pre-shared keys, Troy, is because of convenience, right? Because it's really hard to remember it and give it to friends who come to visit. So sure, you know, I, 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 I have a guest network at home. I do find that when people come to visit, they want to use the Wi-Fi and they ask what the password is and I give them the guest Wi-Fi. They seem somewhat horrified, like, what, you don't trust me? And how can you say, no, I absolutely don't trust you. I don't trust my own family, my own friends of my own family. No, what a horrible thing for, no, it's inconvenience, right? Or convenience and inconvenience, that's where we end up going. Now, that does sound a little bit paranoid, but there was a case the other day where a hacking group wanted to break in to a company and they couldn't because the defenses were too strong or it was too inconvenient. They just followed one of the executives home and they had an eight character password. But how did they know which SSID was the gentleman in question? Because his SSID was like 5224 Weatherby, which was his address. Yeah, he, he actually called, put his SSID, his street and house number of his address. So they could spot that one incredibly easy. And they just- and even, yeah. And with a bit of effort, they could actually you know, kind of uh, capture the SSID in the office and correlate it with the SSID they see that has his home address because his device will actually probe for that SSID eventually. Oh, uh, right. yeah. and, but, but I think the, the two SSID approach where you have one for, and, 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 and I have, and I am, I'm actually also using the one X at home, um, but I have uh, also guest SSID um, and the thing you have to remember with that SSID is that you have devices out in the world. I'll have some uh, devices on the Faroe Islands. I'll have devices uh, in Germany. I'll have devices in the US that actually have my pre-share key on the system. Yeah. yeah. So my pre-share key is available there. And now I'm really paranoid. I don't like it. So uh, that pre-share key is only for my guest network with only internet access. Um, and that's kind of what I do. Uh, I, I, I'm more happy by doing that. Um, it, it's still not as convenient as you say, Troy, with four characters. Um, I'm still handing out a kind of a, I think it's 12 characters, long uh, appreciate key for that. Well, it, um, it, it surprises me that people go to so much, so much, the, let, let me rephrase that. People do so much to try and be as secure as possible. And then they tip the pre-shared key on the back of the, the home router. Go ahead. Sorry, Bill. The effort we're putting into securing our networks should uh, match what we're trying to protect. Yes. And, so, you know, so, so we have would a nation state to balance attack fill is the question you have to ask, right? So uh, Phil may be, not Tor. Well, well, does Phil work on the secret nuclear program at the local... Oh, you know, don't say anything. You have to kill us afterwards. <laughs> no, Phil doesn't, right? So, no. but the point is, if a nation state comes after you, for whatever reason, you have to involve your nation state to protect you. And so mm. there is a certain point where... You know, you may have to contact the FBI and say, look, something's wrong. We've we found stuff. You may have to involve the FBI or other three letter acronyms in the country you're in and be aware that this sort of spying does go on. You know, nation states spy on the, the population of other nation states and their own nation states. And there comes a time when you have to ask, what am I keep, what am I protecting? And what am I protecting against? And it sounds like paranoia, but like you said, Tor, you have to make the security solution fit the requirements of the system. Yeah, you, yeah. you don't want to spend a million dollars protecting something that's worth $100,000 is the point that I always use. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Tor? Uh, sorry, what do you think, Troy? I, I, uh, I agree with that, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, reducing your risk and minimizing your risk. Right, and doing that analysis, what are the uh, potential losses that I have from, from an exposure? And uh, is it worth uh, the expense and the 
the the burden, uh, the overhead that I'll have to go through to to make those systems more robust. Is it is it worth that that pain and frustration to my users? And ev every situation's uh, different. Yeah. Uh, so just uh, one of the solutions I, I really like, and a lot of vendors have the solution, is the uh, the, the, the multi uh, pre shared key. So like the, the PPSK, the DPSK, MPSK, that type of solution where you can have a single SSID, and instead of having a global or yeah a single SSID, instead of having a global pre shared key, you can have user or device specific keys that you can share with the, with the, your users uh, that can have uh, no expiration period or they can expire every nine months or after twenty four hours, right? So for your guest users. Give them a key that uh, self um, uh, self explodes uh, after 24 hours, right? And then it, it's gone forever. Uh, and you can make that relatively uh, simple password, right? If it's only valid for 24 hours and it no longer works on your mm -hmm. system, feel free to keep that uh, super short key, right? Because uh, if it takes them, you know, 36 hours to crack it, well, by the time they crack it, that key is no longer useful on on the system. Absolutely fantastic conversation, gentlemen. I am aware of the time, so I'm going to suggest that maybe we. Uh call it there for today. I'm Troy Martin. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Troy Mart, uh, the handle Troy Mart, and uh, our co-host uh, Phil Morgan. How can uh, people reach out and get a hold of you? You can find me on Twitter at, at CCIE5224. It's me. All right. And cool. Thanks, Phil. And Tor Olson, how can uh, people get a hold of you? They can get a hold of me at Twitter um, at the handle at 2RN1. So it's two, Romeo, November, and the number one. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Thanks, guys. See you next time. See you. See you guys.